Hi, I'm Kristen, and this is the Simple Handmade Everyday Podcast, where I talk about living a creative, intentional life. I like to chat about quilting, knitting, what I'm reading and watching, and a little bit about self-care, productivity, and keeping a cozy, organized home. I've got my cup of tea in hand, so grab yours and let's settle in for a chat. This is episode 87. Hello, friends. Wow, it's good to be back. I have to sort of chuckle to myself. I am surrounded by piles of things that I want to talk about today. I've been so excited to podcast because I just feel like I've I've got some things to share with you. But first of all, before I forget, do you have a lovely beverage with you? Uh, my cup of tea today is by a new company to me called Zest Tea, Z-E-S-T, T-E-A. And um, they reached out to me and offered to send me some tea and I'm going to be honest with you at first I resisted a little bit because what they said is that it's high caffeinated tea high caffeine tea and I was like I'm not sure that's really my thing Um, but then they said you know just give it a try so I said okay so they sent me a package and um, first of all it's not like high caffeine like this is like red the red bull version of tea it's black tea that's got basically the same amount of caffeine as coffee. So this was kind of interesting for me because recently I've had some issues with my stomach where I've had to give up a lot of things that give me life, to be honest with you. I cut way back on drinking tea and I basically just started drinking like mango ginger tea and and with no caffeine. And then I cut down to one cup of coffee a day in the morning. And then that was kind of bothering me. So I just skipped that cup of coffee and went straight for the tea. And I realized something about coffee that I'd forgotten about. And that is that coffee kills your appetite, that caffeine kills your appetite. And I am an intermittent faster, so I don't eat until lunch. And that is not usually a problem. I don't even usually think about eating until lunch anymore. But I did that day. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's a little side benefit. So what's nice here is that the caffeine will um, will kill that appetite. But anyways, I'm actually back on drinking my one cup of coffee because I really missed it. So what's nice about this tea? So let me just tell you, I am drinking the Blue Lady flavor, which is black tea, orange, lemon, and hibiscus. And I have to tell you, it is delightful. It is delicious tea. I am absolutely loving it. So what it's telling me here on the package um, is that it gives you caffeine without the crash, which I found to be true. I've been drinking it for a couple of days now. So it has 150 milligrams of caffeine. Coffee has 125. If you drink the size of coffee, cup of coffee I drink, it's probably at least 125, if not more. And then regular black tea has 50 uh, milligrams. So if you need the caffeine bump like maybe in the afternoon or something like that um, this seems like a really good option so I'm gonna they sent me a few different things to try I'm gonna keep testing them out but I have just I just had to share with you today that the blue lady flavor and I'll put a link in the show notes they have it on Amazon is absolutely delicious they also I went to the website to check it out they have this blue lady flavor as CBD tea so um, and CBD is you know one of those things it's like it's like marijuana, but it's not. <laughs> it's got the good parts about it, but it's not does not get you high. But it it is relaxing apparently. So I thought that was interesting. That version is not highly caffeinated, as you can imagine. But I thought that was very interesting. I'm like, I didn't even know there was CBD tea. But anyways, um, so that is what I'm drinking today, and am loving it. They also apparently do have some energy drinks. They sent me a few of those. I've not tried them yet. So um, it's a little bit of a work in progress here, but I just wanted to be truthful about the tea that I'm drinking today. And that is zest tea. All right, let's get into it. Where are you? Are you having the gorgeous weather that we are right now? I'm in Southern California here at the beginning of May. And I mean, the weather is perfection. I am absolutely loving it. I'm spending as much time as possible outdoors and working in the yard which brings me to my first major speed bump of my goals for the year which I've mentioned on other podcasts that I'm working on Uh, my big goals for the year was planning a big vacation which we've done going to Italy two uh, losing weight getting healthy three doing my bathroom renovation four doing a cutting garden and out in the backyard well in southern california we are in the third straight year of drought and they are instituting some um 
water restrictions, and including only watering once a week and um, just all kinds of things, 80 gallons per day per person. And where we live, I mean, it's just my husband and I, and I already take short showers and who leaves the water on when they're brushing their teeth anymore? I mean, we, out of just just habit conserve as much water as possible we only run full loads of laundry only run full loads of the dishwasher so we're already doing all the things we can do pretty much but it's the outdoor watering that really gets us so um, I've decided to let the cutting garden go um, so my last round of planting seeds outside <laughs> yielded much better results <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know, I haven't counted, but I'm going to say I had a solid 60 to 70% germination rate. So some things are coming up in the garden right now, and I'm not going to, I'm just going to leave them alone. A lot of it gets overspray from um, when we, when we water the lawn. So I'm just going to see what survives and maybe help a few things along. But, you know, normally my goal here would have been, okay, I'm going to go back and do another round of replanting or go buy some nursery plants to fill in. And that is kind of my, my MO at this time of year is like, okay, what are we going to improve in the yard? I want to pull out that bush and replant this and, and I need to move that, you know, the, all those kinds of things. And I end up buying you know, a whole round of new plants and annuals and things like that. And we just have kind of made the decision this year to not do that. We will keep weeding and mulching and trimming what we have. But um, the way the yard is right now is how it's going to stay for right now. And I'm a little disappointed. Uh, I know it's the right decision. But on the other hand, <laughs> I think it's kind of interesting that when, um, when you make your world smaller, like, when you just make these decisions like this, it kind of makes your decision making process so much easier. So like, I'm just, you know, instead of having to think about, okay, well, you know, I want to replant the hanging baskets, you know, what should I, you know, I, I put in some fuchsias last year, one of them's getting too much sun. So I was going to pull that out and replant something else. And now I'm not, you know, so it's, it's easy to make decisions when you've when you've made a decision like this so the answer just kind of is no like so when I think well what I don't have to make these decisions about well how do I want to redo this section of the yard because I'm just not going to do that this year it reminds me my mom's um, one of my friend's moms gave me this advice when we first became a one income family when I stopped working to stay home with my first um, child Chloe and um, and, you know, I squeezed every last penny out of that budget. And I remember her mom saying, um, and, and she raised four kids, one income teacher salary. And she said, you know, it actually kind of frees you up because basically you don't have to make a lot of decisions about things because the... <laughs> The answer is always no. Like, should we, you know, can we afford to eat out? Can we afford to do this? Can we afford to do that? No, you know what? The answer is no. <laughs> so you just get used to going, okay, this is what we're doing. We are making our own food. We're staying at home. We're doing things on the cheap. And um, and it was kind of, I felt that way during COVID. Um, you know, the answer to our, you know, are we going to go out to dinner? Are we going to go on vacation? Are we? Do the answer was no. We just had a very small life and that was fine for that period of time. So that is where I am with the yard. The answer is no. I'm not doing any re, you know, major plans of how I'm going to redo this yard. We're just going to maintain it. And there's a certain freedom in that. So um, that said, my Mother's Day gift, this, I'm recording this a little bit before Mother's Day. My Mother's Day gifts in the past several years have always been something sort of outdoor related because it's the time of year I'm always outside so a few years ago I got my hanging swing chair which I absolutely adore it's the very best thing that I've like almost ever received as a gift I love it um, last year um, I got these planters and we planted them up um, I think I got the planters for my birthday and then we um, invested in all the plants and things like that to plant them up for Mother's Day and this year I did actually ask for wind chimes I like the low tone wind chimes. So we'll see if I get those. So I'm all for sort of improving the space in a way that I can enjoy it, but just let's calm down on the actual buying of plants and um, and watering. I mean, there's even, there's, there's, there's talk of banning outdoor watering um, in as, as soon as the fall. So yeah, I just, I don't want to invest in anything that it's gonna die off later. But anyways, 
even with all of that sort of um, pivoting and a little bit of disappointment, I'm still loving being outside. Um, this is the time of year that I really get into handwork and knitting so that I can do it outside. And there's more on that um, in a little bit here. So before we get going on the quilting segment, I'd like to thank the Fat Quarter Shop for sponsoring the podcast. The Fat Quarter Shop is a one-stop show for quilting fabrics and supplies for quilters around the world. They stock quilt shop quality fabrics, pre-cuts, quilt kits, patterns, notions, and even cross-stitch supplies. So they recently just released the Christmas Time Mystery Sew Along Quilt Kit. So this is a kit that will feature a, um, a free pattern, but the kit has a new line of fabric called Christmas Stitched by Fig Tree Quilts, and it's absolutely a adorable it's gorgeous I love it so this so long will start in July and as I said the pattern is free and I'm actually going to be sewing along for this one uh, so I've FYI I've seen the pattern and it's super cute but it's going to be a mystery for you so I'm going to be sewing along and I am using the merry making line by gingerbread um, put out by Moda and I love this line so this fabric has um, a lot of your you know it's a Christmas line right so it's got a lot, a lot of standard red and green but I'll tell you what it has that a lot of Christmas lines don't have it's got beautiful blues there's a lot of navies and then some lighter blues as well and then um, silver metallic um, the some of the prints are silver metallic and that looks so pretty that silver on blue is just so wintry and silver on white so I'm totally leaning into the wintry blues and whites and silvers for my project and I'm very excited to get started so I will put some links in the show notes I will link you to the reservation for the quilt kit with the the more traditional and absolutely lovely um, Christmas stitched line and I'll also link over to the merry making line just so you can get a glimpse at it um, I'm, I'm very excited about it so let's get into it for quilting. Last podcast, um, I came to you with a rather existential crisis about what next, what am I going to work on next in quilting and knitting, things like that. And I've, uh, I've come to some decisions and we'll see how long I stick with them, but they're decisions for now. So my focus right now um, for my quilting is to use what I have. And again, you know, with inflation the way it is with prices the way it is um, I just feel inspired to use up what I have and so I pulled out the and I, re I reviewed this in an earlier podcast this is called the quilting life planner and workbook and I started working through this and this is by Sherry McConnell of a quilting life and this is just a little gem of a book it's spiral bound and it's a workbook and it it's more than just like a way to keep track of your whips which is why I took it out to be honest with you but then I was like oh gosh I mean she just has so many sections in here um here's like here's a reflection exercise what are the fa your favorite finishes over the past week the past month past quarter past year um why do you love these finishes you know so you can do more things like that um, what what do you want to do more of um, and what have you made that you didn't like and why didn't you like that I mean it just really helps you get down to the the brass tacks of things so that's just like one page of, of many in here um, so there's lots of ways to um, to use this book but I was looking at the uh, a place to make it's actually this section called making lists so she has a page for current works in progress and then, oh, and lots of space there uh, for those. Let me flip the page here. Um, Long-term works in progress. You know, like if you're working, I don't know, on a Dear Jane or something like that. For me, on the long-term works in progress, the very first quilt that I started hand piecing was a Fat Quarter Shop um, charity quilt from, I don't even know how long ago it was now, like maybe eight years ago. And I have made all the blocks and now I just need to sash them. Oh, I need to lay them out and figure that out and then and then do the sashing. And I actually love doing that, um, the sashing part, because it's just really easy sewing. So that is a, a quilt that it's kind of long term. It's a it's a fairly large, completely hand, hand pieced quilt. And I but I forget about it. So I love this idea that now it's on this list. And as I review this, um, I can say, OK, every month I want to make some some progress towards this. 
And then she's got a place for bucket list projects, um, you know, which are maybe like if you wanted to make a Dear Jane quilt or a double wedding ring or whatever those things are. Um, I actually use this in a little bit of a different way because I, I don't have things like that personally. So I'm all about personalizing and what you've got to make it work for you. Um, but they are the, the projects that are kind of hanging over my head that I, that I forget about. Okay, so let me back up here. So I want to, to use what I have. So I don't have that many whips. You know, I went through a big, um, you know, sort of decluttering thing a couple years ago. And I'm pretty good at just, you know, going through that stuff and getting rid of stuff that I think I'm never going to finish. And I, I did that during um, COVID. Um, but I do have some things that I do want to finish. So um, last year, the, the uh, handpiece quilt along quilt um, is called, the pattern is called Harmony. And when we were preparing for the quilt along, I made a, um, a big quilt. So it's a very large block. I can't even tell you how big it is right now. Um, I'm looking at, I think it's 28 inches. And um, so the full size quilt is four of those big blocks. So I did that ahead of time and that quilt is finished and photographed and shared on Instagram and I love it. Um, but I wanted to sew along with the group when we, we did the, the handpiece quilt along. And um, so I just made a one block version with um, one of Minky Kim's fabric lines. And, um, but I never really finished it. The, the quilt was finished, and, but it was sort of half hand quilted. And so I, I just pulled it out and I just said, you know what, I'm just gonna finish this. And oh man, I loved it. Well, I couldn't knit anymore <laughs> because my dog was driving me crazy. So I just sat up at my, the table, that's my sewing room table. And normally when I like to do something like hand piece or hand quilt, I want to be snuggled on the couch, but I just sat at the table and did just a simple cross hatch um, that's an inch and a half apart from each other. The lines are inch and a half apart. And I used um, painter's tape that was just an inch and a half wide, which I think is the easiest way to, to mark a quilt. And um, so I finished that and it came together in no time and now I've hand sewn the I, I've m machine sewn the binding on the front and I'm going to hand stitch it on the back I'm not such a purist that I will not uh, machine sew <laughs> the binding on the front so that is ready for me to finish up and and it's actually waiting because then I got sidetracked by a knitting project that I will talk about in a few minutes so when this is completely done then I will go back to kind of the same situation the handpiece quilt along quilt that I did for our second handpiece quilt along which was called book club and while of course I finished the quilt top I kind of procrastinated on the hand quilting that one um I kind of regret this now, sort of. I've tried a few different things on that one. I tried doing a Baptist fan with a stencil. I It wasn't working out for me, so I ripped that out. Now I have three different size circles that I just cut out of cardboard, and they're sort of like concentric circles. So um, that's the hand quilting motif, just like these randomly placed circles, and then they're concentric. So it's not... Um, it's not a spiral it's three distinct circle sizes so that's going to be next um, for for the quilting what else is on my list I'm going to be um, eventually doing the hand, the uh, the fat quarter shop Christmas quilt along and um, I am cutting for my second cabin valley quilt so so those are like I'm going to finish those all the way through now what I have down as my bucket list are just the things that I've got fabric for and I've just never made a quilt um, and I'm not talking about my stash fabric I've stat, you know fabric set aside for things so one I've talked about it before is this Christmas panel that I want to use the orange dot quilts um, pattern I can never remember what it's called but basically it's kind of that um, what do they call it the stack and whack thing <laughs> where you kind of whack it up into um, half square triangles you leave one panel on the back so you can see what it was but it makes it a more abstract quilt which I think is going to be the right choice for me for that panel so I want to do that at some point um met like oh, close to 10 years ago I went to the sisters outdoor quilt show and I bought fabric there I bought a pattern I've never made it I don't think I'm going to make that pattern but I want to use that fabric because that really is sentimental to me um, also, I have two fat quarter bundles of this line called Sweet Prairie. It's, um, 
not even available anymore from a designer called Down Grapevine Lane, and I absolutely love it. Um, but I've never known what to make with it. So I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> I'm going to use that fabric. So these are like, you know, they're like in bundles. Um, and I, I want to use those. Um, I want to do some sort of a quilt that has a low volume background. And, and um, maybe I can, you know, work that in with the Sweet Prairie one. I'm not really sure. But I visited a quilter recently and she did a beautiful um, half rectangle quilt that had uh, with blues and greens. And... Um, the background was that that low volume prints and it kind of opened a door for me because I I tried doing this recently tried doing a quilt that had a low volume background and thought I don't have enough of these low volume prints that go together like some are really white and some are more creamy and some are kind of a, have a stronger print and some aren't some are modern and some are floral and when I saw her quilt I was like she really mixed it up like she had all those things I just mentioned and it still looked great so um so that quilt actually just made me think okay I want to do a low volume thing and I want to do a half rectangle quilt I love half or triangles but I want to kind of play around with um with half rectangles and so so that's another kind of uh, type of quilt I want to make um, I kind of like to revisit an Irish chain I made an Irish chain you know that's like the most basic of quilts a few years ago and I gave it away um, and I would think I, I kind of want one for myself so I have got a free pattern for that Irish chain on my blog and I may try a different version like maybe a double Irish chain something like that so um, so anyway, so this is kind of my list. It's more than enough to keep me busy for the rest of this year and doesn't require me to, um, you know, buy a lot of fabric. And it, it helps me, you know, I want to use what I have. I've already paid for it. I put that money into the economy. I want to get um, get my use out of it before I don't like those fabrics anymore. So then that just leaves the, the, the purchases of um, quilt backs, <laughs> um, which is always, I'm always a little bummed when I have to, when I get to the quilt back part. So, so that's, the, those are my plans um, quilting wise. And I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about that. So just kind of trying to, to rein in the spending, rein in the impact on the environment. Speaking of being more eco-friendly, I'd like to welcome a new sponsor to the podcast, which is Echo Peco Cutting Mats. So I've talked about them before, I've done a review, but Echo Peco makes these wonderful eco-friendly cutting mats. And if you're like me, you like to keep the, the chemicals to a minimum in your life, including in the sewing room. So the Echo Peco mats are made from polypropylene. And you might wonder, why do I care about what they're make, made of? But it, polypropylene is non-toxic, it's recyclable, which I really love, and it's odorless. In fact, it's the same type of plastic that they use for food containers, so it's, it's very safe. The mats are also PVC free, which is great because PVC, which is also known as vinyl, has all kinds of damaging effects on your health and the health of the planet. So it's it's best to avoid it if at all possible. So back to the mats. These are obviously they're self-healing cutting mats and they come in three sizes, 12 by 18, 18 by 24, and 24 by 36. Why anyone would have one smaller than 24 by 36 is beyond me. The bigger, the better for cutting mats. So if you've got the space, get the biggest one you can uh, you can afford or you know and that you have space for so they're reversible and they come in three colors so there's a they call it quetzal blue mocha brown and jade green and another thing that I love about them is that there is a dark side and a light side so you can get contrast on whatever fabric you're cutting have, have you ever had that situation where you're on a dark cutting mat and you're dark using dark fabric and you just cannot see that line just flip that sucker over and get the contrast you need I do that all the time and um, they come in versions with inches and metrics so we've got you, you all covered I have the blue one I love it it's beautiful I use it all the time um, and a couple other things I like about it is it's got markings for all the usual paper sizes so if you do paper crafting or things like that it's perfect um, I just recently used it for that just because I needed to cut something to a size and it's just nice the way it's very laid out for you so if you'd like to give one a try uh, I'll put a link in the show notes and you can use the code she 10 so she is simple handmade every day 10 to get a 10% discount for all the Simple Handmade Everyday listeners, which I'm super excited about. Um, and when you get it, it comes packaged in a special box and it's flat. Even the 24 by 36 one comes packaged flat. 
out of the box, ready to go. It's not smelly at all. Don't forget to use the code SHE10 to get a 10% discount if you want to give those a try. Let's talk some knitting now. In the last episode, again, <laughs> was having the accidental crisis about what am I going to knit? I live in California. I don't need any more socks. I don't need hats. And uh, my wrap is going to take forever. And I don't even know how much I'm going to use it. You know, blah, blah, blah. Not sure what to do. So Erica chimed in on um, the Simple Handmade Everyday private Facebook group and commented. I love it when people do that. I always post the episodes in there. And then I love it when people kind of comment on that, um, on the episode in there. So we can all sort of share in that. But Erica said, Okay, I think I've got an idea for you on what you can knit. And she gave me two charities. Um, and I really focused on one of them, um, which is called Knots of Love. The other one was Knitting Hats for Sailors, which is fine. But Knots of Love specializes in people knitting hats for cancer patients undergoing chemo. And as a breast cancer survivor, that is very close to my heart. I would have loved to know that there was something like that out there. So that day I got on the website, I checked it out. I will put a link in the show notes for sure. Um, they have a bunch of free patterns. And after looking through them, where it is, I have this printed out right here. I um, picked the Brandi beanie, which is, um, I think most of these just use worsted weight yarn. And um, I'm in the middle of knitting it right now, which, ugh, Tell me if you're a knitter, if you have this problem. It seems like I feel like I have a gazillion knitting needles. I have um, I have circulars that are, um, what are they called? You know, where you can, you can, you know, screw off the different, um, man, what is that word? Are you guys all yelling that word at me? You can take off the tips and put different size tips on it, on the circular needles, um, which seems, you know, very handy. But so this called for size six, 16 inch circulars. First of all, whatever those needles are that you can change the size of the of the cable on them they do not come 16 inches they're longer than that usually so 16 inch ones are usually just you know like it's it's your one pair it, they just are standalone standalone is a good word um and i have so many sizes i had i think 11s 10s 9s 8s 7s and 5s but did i have 6s no <laughs> I had sixes with longer cables. Ultimately, I was like, I am not going to buy another set of needles for this. So I'm just using sevens. It's a hat. It's stretchy. It's going to be fine, right? Tell me it's going to be fine. I'm sure it will. Because um, I really wanted to use what I had here. So I, I did have the size six circular needles. I, I did a big clean out on my yarn last year and I only had yarn that I, that is sort of committed to different projects but I had I can't even tell you what it was this gray worsted weight yarn I don't I think maybe I was gonna knit a small blanket for project Linus or something I even started I didn't even look at what it was I just <laughs> took one of those balls of yarn um, they have a, an approved yarn list and I double checked that it is on the approved list it's just it's cheap acrylic yarn like from Michaels it's um, what's it called like Lionheart Heartland I think it's called so it was on the approved list and I just cast that sucker on and I am having such a good time knitting this because it's small you know it's just it's a hat and I think because it's not like a blanket like the wrap I was knitting that was like all over my lap my new little dog is is not getting in my way about it. As a matter of fact, I was knitting the other night on the couch and he was like right next to me and the ball of yarn was right next to him and he was totally fine. So um, I was very excited about that. So it is great to be um, to back to knitting and I love this idea that um, I'm knitting for charity, which is, you know, I want to do things that are more charitable in life. So if I can kind of um, mesh those two things together, it's a very affordable way to, to be charitable. So, um, yeah, so knots of love. I will put that in the show notes. And I don't know, maybe do we need to launch like a charity arm of Simple Handmade Every Day where we're all like knitting for certain charities? I don't know. I'm just thought of that this very moment and we'll probably regret saying it later. But maybe, maybe that's what we need to do. Um, but it was just like, it, it was so crazy that of course I the one size that I needed you know I didn't have which I don't think happens so much in the quilting world unless it's like oh I started this project with this white and I'm out and I, I had that problem I, I should write down 
exactly what color white <laughs> this sounds crazy I use for each project because I've got different Moda whites and I've got Kona bone and I've got a Riley Blake white and I was trying to match whites on a project and you know I, I couldn't quite tell it, it seems fine until you sew it on then you're like nope that was not the right color so probably keep, need to keep better notes well also speaking of knitting as I've, I've gotten re-obsessed with knitting I really wanted to find a knitting group this is my my I would like a crafting group where we can sit around and we can talk knitting or sewing or whatever um and drink coffee and just you know be around that sort of those sort of like-minded people that I have a hard time finding in real life to be honest with you so I tried using the meetup app have you heard of this I learned about this from my daughter who found a writing group she's a writer um she found a writing group through that um and so I, I checked it out and it was it was not great <laughs> but it, it, for my area it might be for your area if you're looking for something like this I did find a knitting group in in an in-person one that was in Ventura and there even had days um there was two basically you could meet on like I don't know Thursday nights or Tuesday morning depending on your type of schedule which is great it's just that it's a little too far away from me and then there was another one that was a little closer but it was virtual I'm like no I'm not going to do that so um I am still I'm sort of plotting to put together a knitting group um you know with people near me there is a a, a knitting store here but I I think I'm not sure that's really the right fit so anyways um if you have any any advice about how to put together something like that or if you've tried the meetup app or let me know how that that works but what I did stumble onto also there is there's all kinds of groups so I found a cozy mystery reading group <laughs> like how me is that so that is it is virtual I'm not sure that this is really going to get off the ground with me but I did download um there the the cozy mystery that they're reading for this month and I'm reading it I'll talk about that. Um, well, I guess I can just talk about it now. The book for this month was called Hems and Hems and Homicide by I've already forgotten Elizabeth Penny, and it it's cute. I'm like three quarters through it. It's not my favorite cozy mystery, um, but it is about a woman who's probably in her late 20s and her grandmother who are opening up a store it's the first in a series they're opening up um a store that I'm not 100% sure what they're gonna sell because they haven't opened it yet she she makes aprons she's obsessed with making aprons and so things like aprons and vintage linens like tablecloths and embroidered um uh, napkins and pillowcases and things like that so they're going to put together this little vintagey store um, and so the the mystery is okay I'm not super captivated by it but it's cute so I thought um, I would just try it out um, apparently I'm sort of on the waiting list to even get into the discussion so it's I think it's kind of popular I think this whole book club is based in Los Angeles and um, but it is but it's virtual so that people from all over can do it so we'll see we'll see um how that goes but I thought that was good I'm like oh I never even thought about like a specifically cozy mystery book club I should probably start one of those myself so that is what I'm reading I'm also reading I don't really have much to talk about what I finished um round robin which is the second book in the elm creek quilts novel series by jennifer Cheverini. i talked about the quilter's apprentice last time so i'm continuing with my idea of perhaps rereading um this series and i'm enjoying it very much um and i am surprised <laughs> i'm surprised and not surprised by how much i have forgotten about these early books which you know I read over 10 years ago so I mean I know the broad strokes but some of the the details I had forgotten so if you do love quilty fiction but not mystery um round robin by Jennifer Cheverini is fun and what else of course because I'm me um I listened to the cruelest month um as an audiobook which is one of the Louise Pennies which I would love to go back and just do the Louise Pennies from the beginning again I am ridiculous not so much for the the mystery of the book 
But to get the whole, there's a whole overarching storyline through all like 17 books, basically, that um, when I go back and listen to them out of order, I've, I've kind of lost the thread on, which seems ridiculous. I should have those books memorized by now. But I thought, oh, that would be fun to just mostly pay attention to, to the overarching storyline. But whatever I do, I do. I make no apologies for my love of rereading treasured books. So... Now, let's talk about um, some TV shows. Last episode, I was saying how we were watching Star Trek Discovery, which is on Paramount Plus, and how it was just not really grabbing me. But I think there's about maybe 10 episodes, and the last three finally grabbed me. <laughs> so it, it took a while to pay off, um, but it ended up that I really ended up enjoying um, that series and I'm glad that I watched it and somewhere in the middle I'm like oh my gosh I don't really like I don't understand where this is going um, but but uh, it was worth it the payoff was there but I was very excited to move on to Picard um, the second season of Picard of course I am just such a Star Trek um, nerd you know and actually here's how nerdy I am as I'm watching Picard I, I used to think in my 20s when I was super into Star Trek Next Generation, like when I would get in these certain situations, I think, what would Jean-Luc Picard do? <laughs> I know I'm supposed to be thinking, what would Jesus do? I'm thinking, what would Jean-Luc Picard do? Um, and I'm realizing there are so many similarities between Picard and um, Inspector Gamache, Armand Gamache from my beloved Louise Penny series. They are just these very wise, even-tempered, diplomatic father figures they are so they're they're so similar and I, I never realized that until um just starting watching Picard this time so um that uh is I've been enjoying that we're only a few episodes in but it's got a again a great cast of characters um you know I never really got into any other Star Trek shows like I did um Discovery like I have to really care about the characters I'm, I'm so much more character driven than plot driven and um, Picard has this great cast of characters. Again, we've got women in stronger roles. There's a lot of diversity. I mean, I just think like we've come a long ways since since the 80s. And, and so I'm enjoying that aspect of it. But I can't tell you much about the storyline except for that um, it's got some good twists and I'm absolutely enjoying the this, this storyline. Yeah, I never know how much to do without spoiling but I'm going to leave it at that. Oh, and lastly, who is going to go see the Downton Abbey movie? I am so excited about the new Downton Abbey movie. My friend Patty sent me this video that was a great recap. I will, if I remember, I will try to post it in the show notes. Um, it was, um, if you know the, the show, it was Mosley doing a recap of the first movie, which... Um, my daughter and I saw it together. We watched Downton Abbey together. We saw the movie together. We had high tea before we went. And we left just thinking, okay, that was not the greatest movie, but it was sure fun to visit all those people again. And I'm sure that is how the second movie will be. But to show you how sort of throwaway the plot line was for the first one, when I watched the recap, I'm like, that was what that movie was about? I totally didn't remember it. The only thing I remembered was that the queen was coming for tea or for lunch or something. <laughs> that was the only part of the plot that I remembered. So it was fun to watch the recap. Um, so I'm hoping at some point my, my daughter will come to visit and we can go watch the next Downton Abbey movie together. Before we head into our last segment, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Silk and Sonder, for sponsoring the podcast. Silk and Sonder is a monthly journal subscription that I absolutely love. You get a brand new journal delivered directly to you every single month. Um, the May issue, I absolutely love. It is The theme is empowerment, and it is a wonderful theme, and there are there's poetry, and there are journal prompts to get you going on that. There's a very cool gratitude journal done in a very creative way. There are places that you can keep track of habits, of your sleep, of your moods, um, a lot of free form space for, for free form journaling. And every month they have things that recur like your reflections from the previous month, the um, intentions for the month coming up. There's places for your monthly planning, for weekly planning. I absolutely love the weekly planning setup that has, let me tell you some of the prompts on it. It's, you know, it's got your calendar. It's got your, your days of the week. Um, it has a place that says this week I want to feel. 
and there's a place for your major three goals. They've got a place for weekly to-dos, another place here that you can track your habits. There's a place that you can track your your um, your meal plan. I sometimes use that to track my exercise, even though there actually is a place to track health things. There's a place to jot your shopping list. There's a, um, a little space that says, I'm loving, just to remind yourself of the things that you were loving about whatever season you're in. And then there's a, there are great pages that give you places to do. Um, right now I'm using it as a big to-do list. In the past, I've used it as kind of a, a short, um, uh, kind of diary so you, there's a lot of customization that can happen with these the other thing that I love about Silk and Sonder is their Sonder socials so there these are these uh, event bright um, events that you can sign up for these these online events where you sit with other people who are going through their journal I've done the weekly setup the monthly setup but you can also do the coloring page with other people um, or just all kinds of just they pull a page out of the, the journal and everybody does it together which is very cool if you're interested in giving it a try um, I have a code she 15 which will get you 15% off of a subscription so um, you might want to check that out for the last segment, I want to talk um, about a book that I'm really enjoying. So it kind of goes, it's book and homemaking. It's called The Lazy Genius Kitchen. So this is not sponsored in any way. I just totally want you to know that how much I'm loving this book. So I've talked about The Lazy Genius before many times. She's one of my my gurus. Um, her I think she and I have a lot in common about the way we look at things. She just has done a better job of giving things names. <laughs> <laughs> and then writing a book about them. But so, so in general, the lazy genius way um, is to be, so to be a genius about the things in your life that matter and lazy about things that don't. And you get to pick what matters. So, she, so she's got a book called The Lazy Genius Way that has what she calls her lazy genius principles. And they are things like um, decide once, which I, in my life, called my go-tos. Like, this is my go-to outfit. These are my go-to meals for certain situations. But she has um, all these things up about decide once. So decide once on teacher gifts. Decide once about in-law gifts. Decide once about what you're going to wear every Monday morning. Like, whatever um, is causing you friction in your life, decide once about how you're going to handle that. Like, if you, you're on a meal train, you're giving away meal, meals to someone at church or someone who's injured or something, what's your decide once, this is what I do when I'm going to bring a meal to someone. And it just makes your life so much easier to have less decisions to make. Um, so decide once is one of my favorite principles of hers. Other, the other one is decide what matters. And this is interesting because that's different for everybody. So in terms of things like I don't know, just going on vacation. What matters to you? Is, is, it, is it important to you that you um, are able to cook your own food when you do that? Is, is it important that it's economical? It is, important, is it important to you that you do a lot of sightseeing? Or is it important to you that you get to completely rest and not feel stressed out when you get home? Like the, these are all, people are very different about how they, they uh, what they expect out of a vacation. So um, what matters to you and so so you can make sure that you plan a vacation that you feel good about and doesn't meet someone else's expectations um, she also has the things about uh, go in the right order it's a great book I'll put a link in the show notes um, I use those thoughts all the time so she wrote she's she's kind of a foodie uh, she likes to cook and so she wrote a book called lazy genius kitchen which is not in fact a cookbook and fine frankly I didn't even know that when I bought it because you know, she's she's one of my people that I will always buy her book <laughs> to support her because I love everything she puts out, including all the free stuff she puts out in the world. But she has this book, which there's a funny story with it. It was supposed to come out in March when it was shipping from wherever it was printed, China, Taiwan, I don't know. And it was shipping to the U.S. The boat sank and all the copies of The Lazy Genius Kitchen went to the bottom of the ocean. So there was a big pivot about release dates. So I thought that was kind of interesting. But she has um, lazy genius principles in terms of your kitchen. So this is about how to make your your space, your meals, your meal planning, everything about how your kitchen works, help to streamline it and make it better for you, not for everybody, but for you and what's important to you. So her principles, um, 
for the kitchen are to prioritize, figure out what's important, essentialize, get rid of what's not important, organize it, and do not organize it until you have prioritized and essentialized, which is one of that's that's going in the right order. So you organize. Once it's organized and you have what you need and nothing else, then you can personalize and then you then you systemize and you turn it into a system. So when I first started reading the book, I'll be honest with you, I was thinking, you know, I'm pretty organized in the kitchen. Like I'm not, I'm not, you know, great in all areas of my life, but meal planning and cooking and keeping things going in the kitchen's going pretty well for me. So I'm not sure I'm going to get a lot out of this, but you know what? I actually am because you can always tweak, right? And I like to kind of probably like you, I like to listen to how other people do things and see if that would work for me. And sometimes it does help me up my game and other times I'm like, yeah, I tried that. It doesn't really work. And I actually have kind of some examples of both of those from, from this book. So um, so you're going to apply in this, in her, in the book, you apply these principles of prioritize, essentialize, organize, personalize, systemize to different areas of the kitchen, to your kitchen space, to meaning just to the, the drawers and the refrigerator and, you know, this, the storage spaces and your pantry and all that, um, to your meals and how you're cooking to your meal planning, things like that. So she just kind of gets these ideas in your mind and then she shows you how to roll them out. And what's kind of cool here is that you can use the same framework at for any room, any part of your, your house. <laughs> I saw her somewhere say, I'm not going to write the lazy genius bathroom. So you just need to apply the principles from the lazy genius kitchen, which was kind of funny. So what really got me going and before I even got the book, um, I watched a video. So she created, um, I think it's going to be, I'm not sure if they're all out, like six videos where she goes into someone's house and she applies these principles. So the first one, um, which actually I watched the day after I posted my last podcast, because I was like, oh, I would have loved to have shared this video. So this is my opportunity to do it. Um, and I'll put a link in the show notes, but you can just Google the, the lazy genius on YouTube. So she's got a video where she goes into Sharon McMahon's kitchen. So Sharon McMahon is from Sharon says so she's a, an amazing, basically kind of, I think she might be called America's government teacher. Um, she talks about politics. If you don't follow her on Instagram, she is absolutely unbiased on politics. She just, um, explains what is happening like what the law means and what, what what's happening with with no slant to it whatsoever and she explains things amazingly and she has a podcast which I've never watched but I do follow her on her Instagram stories are amazing so she goes into Sharon McMahon's kitchen to help her organize her utensils her kitchen utensils which just sounds like <laughs> like that sounds like the most boring video ever. It's not. It's funny. I was actually watching it and kind of like smiling and laughing. And my husband said, what are you watching? I'm like, I'm watching <laughs> the lazy genius organize um, Sharon says so's utensil drawer. And he's like, that is so you. <laughs> so anyway, so she puts all these principles into action here and she pulls out all the utensils and she talks about, you know, and it's just funny the things that she has that, that are broken or she doesn't know what they are or she only has half of it. And, and she just kind of walks through. I mean, they're figuring it out on the fly about what drawers he's going in and what's the thought process about, about how they're organized. So it's actually quite good. And then she has another one where she cleans out... Um, who is it? Erin Moon. I think she cleans out her freezer. <laughs> Same thing. It's like she pulls it all out and just kind of explains the process. And she's in no way judgmental. And different things matter to different people. She helps somebody with menu planning. And all she wants to do is cook like easy food four times a week. That's like her highest aspiration. So it's not like it's some, you know, color coded, um, you know, digital menu planning system. It's like so basic. And she just keeps asking questions about, you know, what matters to you? What's important to you? And um, so anyway, so I will post that. I really love the utensil drawer video. But anyway, so it got me thinking about certain areas of my kitchen. For instance, okay, after watching that video, I am such a sucker. I obviously need to go through all our utensil drawers. I have two utensil drawers, two crocks of utensils. I have three utensil drawers <laughs> and two crocks of utensils. Um, 
and and I don't have a lot of stuff I don't use in there because I do go through things pretty re- you know pretty on a pretty good um, basis. But I will admit that I am the only person that understands why things go in certain drawers. So I might need to rethink why they're organized. And um, part of it is like, because it only fits in this drawer, because it annoys me if it's over there or whatever. But I need to, to kind of figure that. I'm also the only person that understands how my, um, my, my freezer is organized or how my refrigerator door is organized. <laughs> You know, like these are things for sandwiches. These are things that are pickly. You know, like nobody understands this. Um, and it's probably, I have to own that, that I've never really conveyed that. But it's just my husband and me now. I don't have to, you know, explain this to five people anymore. Um, but so I do want to get into the utensil drawer. But other, some other takeaways are that my, I want to say my Tupperware, um, which I don't think I even own any actual Tupperware, uh, but you know, my food containers I'm realizing are in the wrong part of the kitchen. They're in a part of the kitchen because of space. And I, I'm not sure I can fix this, um, but, but it's, but it's, you know, I need some a decent amount of space for that. And I have one cabinet that is really more in the, the eating area. So it's in like, it's in the farthest part of the kitchen. And that is not in fact, where I want to um, put the food in the container. So I'm always walking over there and getting it. And I leave that thing open and I walk back and, you know, I'm going back and forth and I'm like, that Tupperware should really be right under where I want to, um, you know, under the cab, the, the countertop where I'm putting the food into the, into the Tupperware. Um, so I'm thinking, okay. And you know what is right below where I'm working right there? Stuff that I don't use very often. Like, Pyrex dishes, which I do use, but not every day, not on the same level that I'm using, you know, like my, my food storage. So I'm like, oh, you know what? I think maybe I need to look at changing that up. So that was kind of interesting. And that, that's what she talks about, keeping your tasks together. And I've done that in other parts, obviously, like, you know, things are the, the plates and the cups and the, they're all near the dishwasher and they're, you know, that's all good. But I'm like, there, that's a flaw in my system. Um, also, she has you look for different places where there is friction. What is annoying you? Like um, on this low level that you don't even realize. And for me, frankly, um, again, with the, the food storage, which mostly I have glass Pyrex, um, but I also have some mishmash of, of other things as well. Um, I kind of like to get rid of everything so that all the lids match, but whatever. That's another time. I don't have enough smaller containers. And this was not a problem when there were five adults here all the time. I didn't have a lot of small amounts of things to put away, but I do now. And so I'm putting them in containers that are too big and they take up too much space in the fridge. And so that's like this little friction thing that I'm noticing, but I'm some for some reason not really doing anything about. Um, the other area that I wanted to talk about is meal planning. And here I'm like <laughs> kind of thinking, Kendra, that's who wrote this, Kendra Dachi. You can teach me nothing about meal planning. I've got that on the rails. But you know what? There are some things um, that I'm kind of picking up. So one thing she talks about for meal planning is to figure out what matters to you. So what, what matters to you about meal planning? Is it that um, you only have to shop once a week? Is it that everything is, is kind of easy? Is it... Um, that it's super healthy? Is it that it, it's, it, you know, um, it, it needs to be out, you know, you're in and out in 30 minutes. Like what, what is important to you? And I'm realizing now that I'm in, in a different phase of life is what's, what matters to me is that I don't have to cook every day. So what matters to me is to plan dishes where they create a lot of leftovers. And what all, so and, and that has kind of always been the case. It was hard to keep leftovers in the house when the boys were home because they would just eat them all up. But now the problem is that, um, you know, my husband and I both work from home and we both love leftovers. So we eat them at lunch, So which meant I, I still am cooking every day. And my husband is very helpful in the kitchen. He cooks a lot. So I'm, I'm not, it's not all on me or I don't need more help or anything like that. It's just, I just don't want to cook a full meal every day. So what I need to do is plan meals that have good leftovers and have things in the house 
that we can have for lunch so that we don't feel sad about not le- about not being able to eat that soup that I made last night that was so good that I really want to have for lunch but I really want you know but even more I want to have that in 2 days you know so so that I realized that's a whole that's what's important to me right now like I already know the types of foods we want to eat I don't have to figure that out anymore what's important to me is that I don't cook every day um, and so part of that is is kind of creating lists. So here's where she and I kind of um, differ. So she's got this idea of a, um, a meal matrix that I had to kind of adapt for my own use. So when I think about, when I sit down to plan a menu, I don't want to start like with an, an empty slate. I need some boundaries. So for me, the way I've usually done it is I kind of go, we'll have like one thing that's chicken, one thing that's beef. And back in the day, one thing that's pasta. I don't really do the pasta anymore. Um, if it's fall or winter, a soup. If it's spring or summer, um, a main dish salad. So that, and maybe one thing that's vegetarian. So that's like five different kind of categories for me to to fill in. And that's always worked for me. Kendra thinks about it a little bit differently. And I tried this last summer. I got a notebook out and she has, oh, I wish I'd grabbed that notebook. More things like food on a bun, <laughs> um, food that goes on rice, food that goes on noodles, um, uh, things from the grill, things in the, I don't know if she does, maybe things in the crock pot. Things, it's, it's more like things like that. It's like she thinks about it very differently. Um, and so I kind of played around with that. So I had like things on a bun and I brainstormed, um, something which she, this is her meal matrix is that you have these, I, these categories and you, your categories can be whatever you want. And you brainstorm a number of meals and just say like for the summer, uh, I'm going to just, you know, keep my decisions to basically what's on this list. And I just pick, you know, my five to seven things or whatever. Um, when I plan my meals based on this predetermined list, um, but it turns and, and oh, then even then it's like things on a bun are on Monday, pastas on Tuesday, tacos are on, or tacos on Tuesday, <laughs> pasta on Wednesday, um, fish on Friday, you know, that kind of a, um, a framework. And then you can kind of plan that out for a few, for like for the whole month, if you wanted to, that didn't really work for me because when I, I just, I, my brain doesn't think that way. So it's like one of those things I tried this on, it didn't really work, but what it does kind of solve is the problem, my problem of like, when I just go, you know, um, fish, chicken, beef or whatever, I would have these weeks where all of a sudden I realized we're basically eating sandwiches three days in a row, <laughs> which that's not really what I aspired to, but that seemed kind of weird. But I think I would rather that than eating chicken three days in a row. So it just kind of, de- again, it depends on like, you know, what is important to you. Um, but my whole meal planning has changed. I used to have a, a notebook or my, my day planner where I always had it right there, you know, by where the phone used to be. Um, and so the kids could come and see what was for dinner. When I stopped using a paper planner, I moved to just putting it on index cards and I had a little clip that hung in the kitchen and then they could check that because for some undetermined reason, I absolutely hate it when people ask me what's for dinner. It creates an unreasonable rage in me. <laughs> So we, I'm just like, go look at the list, go look at this. Do not ask me what's for dinner. Just go look. I don't know why I feel so resentful about that. It's stupid. But anyways, um, now I just write it on the whiteboard and, and basically a couple days, I usually grocery shop on Saturdays. And so on Thursday and Friday, I start just kind of brainstorming ideas that we could eat on the whiteboard and, um, just kind of try to have it filled out by, by Saturday. And then as we eat them, we just, you know, kind of wipe them off the whiteboard. But I am keeping this notebook of ideas because um, having it written on a paper way was nice to go back. And I used to go back to my old calendars and go, what were we eating last year in May? <laughs> you know, and go, oh man, that thing just fell right off my rotation. I don't know why. So I do kind of keep a master list now in a notebook of just, um, so I don't have to recreate the the wheel every time. So anyways, this was a, a very long conversation about, about food, but um I'm really enjoying the Lazy Genius Kitchen, and I think it probably has a little something for everyone to just kind of tweak and up your game. And I'm actually only uh, maybe half through it. I don't even know where she's going to go for the rest of the book, but maybe I'll do an update next time. So um, that, I feel exhausted after that. Before we go, I would like to thank 
some people for leaving reviews. I know. I very, like, you know, sadly asked for reviews last week and people really rose to the challenge. So Butterfly911, Crafty Robin, and Weekly Neater. Thank you so much. Your reviews absolutely made my day. Um, I think it was Weekly Neater that said something about she she came for the quilting and then stayed for the the knitting and the tea and the TV recommendations and um, I got a real kick out of that. So thank you so much for those reviews. You are my very favorites right now. And if you would like to be a favorite, then go ahead and read a review and I will thank you profusely on the next episode. So until then, you can find me online at my blog, Simple Handmade Every Day, on Instagram as Kristen Esser, and please consider joining the Simple Handmade Every Day private Facebook group so that we can keep the conversation going. Have a wonderful week.